Buzz Lightyear is back again, this time for the first time. Wait, that doesn't track. This is the first time we see Buzz Lightyear again. So, no, that's not right. Uh, all right, fine. This is Disney Pixar's Lightyear, a prequel spin-off hybrid that claims to be the movie that Andy's toy is based on. There are secrets and Easter eggs, so let's find them. Well, that wasn't so hard. Lightyear follows Buzz, voiced by the cap himself, Chris Evans, as he struggles to fix a mission he blames himself for going sideways. No big deal, he just, you know, dinged the ship, holding the rest of his colony in hypersleep, only to maroon the community on this uncharted and unfriendly planet filled with giant bugs and sentient vines that want to kill them. Buzz must learn to live with his mistakes as well as reach out to others when he could use some help himself. The others in question are the Junior Patrol. Izzy Hawthorne, voiced by Kiki Palmer, is the granddaughter of Buzz's space ranger partner and dear friend Alicia Hawthorne. Unlike her grandma, Izzy is afraid of space. Mo Morrison, voiced by the multi-talented Taika Waititi, is a lost and clumsy soul trying to find his place without putting himself in harm's way. Dale Souls performs Steel, the oldest of the group with the shortest fuse, and just so happens to be out on parole. Last and most certainly least, we have Derek, a decommissioned Eric droid who gets lost both figuratively and literally, but he's not without his little secrets. Did you happen to see his front panel inscription? It reads, El Riesgo Siempre Vive, which is Spanish for the risk always lives. Basically, luck favors the bold. Now that we've had our Spanish lesson for the day, what's the significance? Why don't you ask Jeanette Goldstein, who played Private Vasquez in James Cameron's supersized sci-fi sequel, Aliens. That's right, Derek's inscription is an exact replica of what she put on her body armor. Am I saying that Derek is just as bold as Vasquez? Absolutely not. Still, according to one entry submitted on Derek's Pixar fandom wiki page, he is very devoted to helping others, careful to not stop until he reaches perfection. At least one person feels that Derek was an underutilized character in Pixar's Lightyear and that he deserved more screen time. Yeah, we see you, Angus McLean, director and voice of both Eric and Derek. Speaking of voices, listen to Featheringhamston, the rookie voiced by comedy great Bill Hader. He is the first example of how Buzz doesn't really play well with others. At one point, he free falls after Alicia Hawthorne shoots one of the vines that attacks him. You'll be looking at her reaction shot when you hear it, but there is no doubt who it comes from or what it is. It's the Wilhelm scream from 1951's Distant Drums. Here's another cool voice-based Easter egg. Another one of Buzz's pet peeves is his autopilot device called Ivan. Ivan is a sort of buggy interactive navigation system, like OnStar. Like really like OnStar. Give a listen to Ivan's voice. That's the voice of Mary McDonald Lewis who just so happens to be the voice of OnStar. When I say Ivan is buggy, I mean it in a way that only kids of a certain generation will fully appreciate. Ivan becomes glitchy and hard to understand during Buzz's first attempt at hyperspeed. Annoyed, Buzz pulls Ivan from its contacts and gives it a blow before connecting it to the ship again. If you had a Nintendo Entertainment System in the late 80s or early 90s, this move is all too familiar to you. When a NES cart-based video game wouldn't load properly, blowing on the contacts was the way to miraculously make your game work again. Although, apparently, we were more likely to corrode the pins doing this. Hey, felt like it worked, so it worked, alright? You cinephiles out there might have noticed something else familiar about Ivan, Derek, and of course Eric for that matter. These droid beings shared a common characteristic with a classic computer villain. That camera lens with the light in the middle is a reminder that sentient AI might not be such a great idea. You might end up with a murderous program like HAL 9000 from Stanley Kubrick's space masterpiece 2001 A Space Odyssey. I'm telling you, computers aren't toys. Well, at least one is. You're gonna need your ears for this one, too. When Buzz is going over the plan for how to destroy the Zerk robots and head home, his emotional companion droid Cat Socks is sitting on a control panel that makes four distinct tones. These tones are a little nod to a 70s and 80s electronic memory game called Simon, which used different color and note-based sequences for hours of fun. Well, more like minutes of frustration. Simon isn't the only bit of 80s tech to get a wink. Check out Buzz when he tries to get a few winks of his own. He claps his hands to turn off the lights. Believe it or not, this is your grandma's technology. In 1984, the clapper arrived on the scene, allowing people to stay seated and just clap in order to turn devices on and off in their homes. It's basically a sound-activated switch that reacts to noise, so as you can imagine, it reacts to other loud sound as well. Not for music lovers or the arthritic. Ouch. Painful. One painful aspect of Buzz's mission is watching his partner Alicia, voiced by Uzo Aduba, live out her entire life in what for him is the span of several days. 
This is because of the time dilation that occurs every time Buzz attempts hyperspeed in an effort to get his colony back home. For every minute he spends up in space trying to reach hyperspeed, years go by on the uncharted planet below. Hmm, an astronaut sacrifices himself and his relationships for the greater good of humanity. Sound familiar? Maybe a little like Christopher Nolan's space-based opus Interstellar, in which Matthew McConaughey misses decades of his kids' lives in the span of minutes, trying to find an inhabitable planet for Earthlings. Wow, bummer, huh? Let's lighten things up a little with some Easter eggs connected to Pixar and Toy Story. Part of the fun of Buzz doing his mission log is watching Alicia give him no end of grief. She even serves up a hilarious soundtrack while he explains the importance of wearing the Space Ranger suit to the rookie. As she's laughing, he says, you're mocking me, aren't you? Where have we heard that before? Well, the first Toy Story, of course. During the scene when Woody comes to realize Toy Buzz thinks he's a real Space Ranger. Speaking of Woody, remember when he first sees Buzz Lightyear standing on Andy's bed in Toy Story? And how that same shot is repeated in Toy Story 2 when Buzz encounters the display Buzz at Alice Toy Barn? Get ready because here it is again, only it's Socks looking up at Buzz after he puts on his Space Ranger suit. Oh, quick, go back, pause! Look behind Socks, and what do you see? A bunch of canisters, but not just any canisters, the yellow ones used on the scare floor in Monsters, Inc. There's another Toy Story 2 Easter egg to be found in the first fight between Buzz and Zerg. Check out the flip and shoot maneuver. It's the same maneuver used by Toy Barn Buzz on the elevator as well as video game Buzz controlled by Rex, though with varying results. Also in Toy Story 2, we learn during the elevator fight that Zerg is Buzz's dad a la Empire Strikes Back. Lightyear tinkers with this concept. When Zerg opens up to reveal his true identity inside the suit, Buzz says, Dad? As it turns out, he's looking at an older version of himself. Did you know that for the older Buzz, Chris Evans went through a temporary surgical procedure to age his voice 40 years? Yeah. No, just kidding, that didn't happen. Older Buzz was voiced by Hollywood legend James Brolin. Did you know that before being cast in the movie, James Brolin had not seen any of the Toy Story movies? Seriously, I'm not messing with you. He knew nothing about the story or the characters and took the job based on the fact that, according to him, the Pixar guys have good judgment. Can't argue with that. He sure has a young Buzz on the run. In the final showdown between the two, Buzz hides from his older self in the floor fence. This is another Aliens-based Easter egg for y'all. The Buzzes are playing out an homage to the scene where young Newt, played by young Carrie Henn, hides from the Queen Alien before Sigourney Weaver brings the pain in the climax of that film. More classic sci-fi movie references abound. How about the arresting sequence when Buzz is spinning out in space while trying to install the crystal drive and gain control of his ship? It feels like the opening sequence of Alfonso Cuarón's space thriller Gravity. Or as I like to call it, Sandra in the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Want another fun movie reference? Listen when the Zap Patrol comes to retrieve Buzz and his junior patrol. They bark, zap, 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 just like the police officers bark, hut, 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 in John Landis's bluesy comedy classic, The Blues Brothers. Buzz and his team have some explaining to do with Commander Burnside, voiced by Isaiah Whitlock Jr. Burnside was the one who told Buzz that the Space Ranger program was going away, which caused Buzz to disobey his orders, steal a ship and socks, and then jump into space. Instead of throwing the team in jail, Commander Burnside reinitiates the Space Ranger program as the Universe Protection Division. Basically, he's rewarding Buzz and his team. The same thing happened to another crew who ignored direct orders from their superiors in order to save the life of a dear friend. In Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, James T. Kirk and his peers stand before the Federation to face the consequences for their crimes. Kirk is demoted from admiral to captain, which basically puts him and his crew right where they wanted to be in the first place, back aboard the Starship Enterprise. Just like the crew of the Enterprise, Buzz and his team board their new ship in order to go out and defend the universe. Get a load of Buzz's ship! It's modeled after the ship box Buzz comes in in the Toy Story movies. Talk about coming full circle! And that's not the last Toy Story reference. What's a movie anymore without a post credit scene or two? In this scene, we join Commander Burnside in his corner office with a view, where we get to witness the benefits of his colony's laser shield firsthand. We also get to see a few tchotchkes sitting on shelves to the left. On the second shelf, there's a statue of an LGM, that's a little green man, from the claw cage at Pizza Planet in Toy Story. He's not alone. There's another space character reference to be found on the right side of the shelf above. It's a Bernie from Pixar's WALL-E. We've only scratched the surface of Lightyear's secrets and Easter eggs. Up for some more? Make sure you subscribe to Movie Logic for more daily movie facts, trivia, and Easter eggs.
Buzz Lightyear finally gets to go to infinity and beyond as the titular character in Disney Pixar's Lightyear. Naturally, Easter eggs and other hidden secrets abound in this new frontier, initiating hyperlaunch. Lightyear is an interesting spin-off. From the opening titles, we learn that we're not following the adventures of Buzz Lightyear, Andy's toy, but rather we're watching the movie on which the toy was based, which of course just so happens to be Andy's favorite movie. This time around, the visuals are more in line with some classic Hollywood sci-fi flicks like Star Wars, 2001 A Space Odyssey, even Aliens. Check out the top shot of the turnip, I mean the ship at the beginning, as it soars through the galaxy. If its space gray surface wasn't enough, take a look at the microgramma font. Both were made famous by the sci-fi TV and movie series Star Trek. The lettering reads SC01TS. The S and C almost definitely stand for Star Command. The 01 probably makes this the first ship of its kind, but what do you think the TS stands for? Might be a fun little wink at Toy Story, maybe. I get a feeling there will be a few more of those. In fact, about a minute later, we're following Buzz like we did in his video game, which opens Toy Story 2. Even the POV from inside of his helmet feels the same, though I do miss the Vader breath. Buzz is even doing his mission logs as per usual, almost verbatim. He's even interrupted by someone at the same spot. This time, it's by his space ranger partner, Alicia Hawthorne, voiced by Uzo Aduba, whom you might know as Crazy Eyes from the hit Netflix series Orange is the New Black. Hawthorne's quite the departure from the unpredictable Crazy Eyes. She's Buzz's anchor and voice of reason when the going gets tough. But wait, something else is different here. Buzz sounds… not quite like himself. That's because in Lightyear, he's voiced by Chris Evans. That's right, Captain America is now also Buzz Lightyear. What the sh so, what's with the absence of Tim Allen, the voice of everyone's favorite space toy? According to Allen in an interview with Extra, years ago there was talk of a possible live-action Buzz. As interesting as that would have been and as this movie is, Allen, though complimentary, didn't see his Buzz as part of this new world, so he stayed out of the way. That's not to say Allen's fingerprints aren't on the character. In fact, it was his influence that made playing Buzz an intimidating proposal for Marvel star Chris Evans. Of Allen, Chris said, he did such a good job and I'd be a fool not to acknowledge the work he did. That's not to say Evans is playing Tim Allen playing Buzz Lightyear. Director and co-screenwriter Angus McLean said he saw the Buzz toy as inspired by the Buzz movie, but for kids. He told Vanity Fair, I've always wondered what movie was Buzz from. Why couldn't we just make that movie? So that's what we did. The movie that Andy saw that changed his life, Andy's Star Wars. Like I said, there are quite a few nods to Star Wars. During the scene where Buzz and Socks are trying to hijack a spaceship, Buzz winds up having an awkward conversation with the control officer. Remind you of someone? How about scruffy rogue Han Solo in Star Wars A New Hope? In that movie, Han has a very clumsy radio conversation with an Imperial officer while Luke tries to find Princess Leia's holding cell. Later, when Buzz and Socks land back on the planet, they encounter a young armored soldier named Izzy. More on her later, but check out the frame of Izzy's periscope binoculars HUD. It uses the same yellow and red vector graphics as Luke's targeting computer during the trench run on the Death Star in A New Hope. Also, maybe you felt your ears perk up after the Zerg robots touch down on the planet and release from their pods. There's an unintelligible voice communication that winks at the sound effect used for the self-destructing probe from The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> I know, I know, I nailed it. Next, when Buzz and his team try to escape the Zerg robots in their ship, take a look at the cockpit setup. Two in the front, two in the back with controls all around in a wide shot. Kind of feels like the cockpit shots from the Millennium Falcon, doesn't it? While we've got everyone here, let's address this ragtag bunch, starting with the droid. Sox is voiced by Pixar Swiss Army Knife Peter Sohn. By Swiss Army Knife, I mean this guy can do pretty much anything. Check out his IMDb and see what I mean. The guys worked in nine different departments, including cinematography, animation, writing, and directing. Sox is a gift given to Buzz by his partner Alicia after his first lightspeed mission fails. Sox is meant to be an emotional companion to Buzz to help him cope with the four-year time dilation. But really, Sox becomes so much more, like Goose in Captain Marvel. Sure, both um, cat-like beings have the ability to regurgitate important resources when needed, but like Goose, there is more to Sox than meets the eye. Did you know that Socks is based on a scrapped character from an early treatment of Toy Story 3? The character was a cat sidekick called Comet, who helped the story's main baddie Dax Blastar. None of this sounds familiar, does it? 
That's because it was developed by a short-lived division of Disney Animation called Circle 7 Animation. Circle 7 came about as a result of a disagreement between then-Disney CEO Michael Eisner and the late Steve Jobs over the details of their Disney Pixar film deal. Eisner wanted to keep ownership of Pixar's productions and the rights to create any and all sequels to already existing franchises. Thus, Circle 7 was born. Things got ugly. Think custody battle over sequels. In any case, once Eisner had to step down and Bob Iger took his position, Iger made things right with Jobs and Circle 7 crew was absorbed into Walt Disney feature animation 14 months after it began operations. In those 14 months, Circle 7 worked on three sequel stories, Toy Story 3, Monsters, Inc. 2, Lost in Scaradice, and Finding Nemo 2, none of which saw the light of day. I'm telling you, man, stuff gets real at the House of Mouse. But let's cut back to the cat. Did you know that Socks was a pretty popular cat name when the movie came out? And by the movie, I don't mean Lightyear, I mean the original Toy Story. Check this out, we know that Andy saw Lightyear in 1995 thanks to the opening titles. That was the same year that Toy Story debuted in theaters. At that time, Bill Clinton was midway through his first term as President of the United States. Bill's daughter Chelsea adopted a stray cat that jumped into her arms while she was leaving a piano lesson. The name she gave the presidential cat? Socks. Next up we have Izzy, voiced by Nope's Kiki Palmer. When Buzz first meets Izzy, he mistakes her for his partner Alicia. That's because he sees that the name badge on her armor reads Hawthorne. Turns out that Buzz has tampered so much with hyperspeed, he's jettisoned himself so far into the future that he's looking at his old partner's granddaughter. See anything else interesting about Izzy's armor? How about the 42 on her armor? That number is significant in two ways. First, the number should ring a bell to readers of sci-fi. In the series The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, written by Douglas Adams, a giant supercomputer is asked the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything, to which the computer replies, 42. As for sports fans and fans of the civil rights movement, the number takes on more powerful significance. The number 42 belonged to Brooklyn Dodger Jackie Robinson. Robinson was Rookie of the Year in 1947, a six-time All-Star, National MVP in 1949, and took part in winning the 1955 World Series. As a player, he was no slouch and he was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1962, but he is also a civil rights icon for being the first African American to play in Major League Baseball. After his death, he was honored with the Congressional Gold Medal and the Presidential Medal of Freedom for his achievements on and off the field. After Izzy, we have Mo Morrison, played by another jack-of-all-trades, Taika Waititi. This is the actor-writer-producer-director's third feature gig with Chris Evans. The two also worked on 2019's Avengers Endgame, as well as Free Guy in 2021. He also helmed Thor Ragnarok and won the Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay for another film he directed, Jojo Rabbit. The man knows what he's doing in front of and behind the camera. Unfortunately, his character, not so much. Mo means well, but he tends to come up short in his execution of, well, just about everything. Steele calls him a quitter. Before the group happened upon Buzz, they called themselves the Junior Patrol. When Mo found out he was signing up for something more serious than a weekend warrior workout situation, he was going to turn in his things. Still, he's packing heat in the form of Chekhov's gun. Doesn't look like much of a gun, does it? It's not. It's a pen. But that pen is also a plot device known as Chekhov's gun a detail within a story that will be used in the story later. For example, if you see a gun sitting somewhere on a screen, the idea is that at some point it will be used. Many writers have since broken the rule of Chekhov's gun in order to throw off their audience, at which point Chekhov's gun becomes a MacGuffin. Anyway, when the Junior Patrol puts on their Space Ranger suits, it's Mo who gets the one worn in the beginning by the rookie Feathering Imston. Voiced by SNL alum and star of HBO's Barry, Bill Hader, you'll notice his suit has burnt red instead of green. This is enough to get a good laugh out of Trekkers, the Trekkies, whatever they call themselves, the Star Trek fans out there. In the original Star Trek series, away teams beam down to unknown planets. The teams usually consisted of the stars of the show, and at least one newly introduced member of the Enterprise security detail who always wore red. These new officers would meet an untimely death so often in the series that the term red shirt was conceived in their honor, or at their expense, depending on who you ask. Thankfully, Feathering's Feather, Feather, uh, the rookie doesn't die, and neither does Mo. But their wearing of that suit sure gives an audience pause. Before we move on to Steel, you might want to pause to see if you can find a famous Pixar Easter egg. Up for the challenge? Here we go! Keep your eyes peeled as Buzz and Socks escape security after the Space Ranger program becomes defunct. They jump inside of a truck and speed off. 
During Buzz's mission log, keep a close eye on the left side of the wide shot and you'll see that somehow, a certain famous food chain has made its way onto a desolate planet with a small community of maroon space travelers. That's right, they even deliver in space. It's the Pizza Planet delivery truck. Well, turns out Buzz isn't the only one on the planet to attempt to steal a ship. Meet Darby Steele, voiced by another inmate from Orange is the New Black, Dale Souls. Darby is on parole and joined the Junior Patrol in hopes of shaving some time off her sentence. She's also pretty good at making things go boom. When being pursued by the Zerg robots, she even grabs a rocket launcher and says, I'm gonna dance with Mr. Boom. Did you look at the model of the rocket launcher she grabs? MR-8-00M. Mr. Boom, indeed. Here's another fun detail. Take a look at her Space Ranger suit. Her name badge reads Tempest. Did you know that Tempest was Buzz's original name? In test footage for the first Toy Story film back in 1992, a very early and very red Buzz model identifies himself to Woody as Tempest from Morph. Yeah, glad they didn't stick with that one. Enjoying these fun facts and easter eggs about Lightyear? Well, don't worry, there's a ton more where these came from. Make sure you subscribe to Movie Logic for more daily movie facts, trivia, and easter eggs. While we're at it, let's look at the facts and predictions we came up with for the Lightyear trailer video. Most of our calls were right on target, but some were embarrassingly off the mark. Enjoy! The trailer opens with a giant round spaceship touching down for a landing, and even though we're just seconds in, we already have our first reference. Look again at the shape of that ship. Does it remind you of the one from another extremely famous movie? While it wasn't piloted by members of Star Command, it looks like Lightyear has taken some serious inspiration from Steven Spielberg's 1982 classic E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Look at the E.T. spaceship and you'll see it's very similar to the one seen here. Each of them are big spherical ships, and they both even have a spire on top. And there's more awesome sci-fi references you probably missed too. Right after the ship lands, we see Buzz cresting a ridge with the spire of his suspiciously E.T.-like ship still visible in the background. Buzz gives the date for his mission log and tells us that it's Stardate 3901. Stardates aren't actually a real method of dating at all, and in fact, they were first made up for another sci-fi series. In Star Trek, the original series, you might remember Captain Kirk starting off his captain logs by giving a stardate. The numbers were completely random and didn't mean anything in order to obscure just when exactly the show was meant to take place. Though eventually, for Star Trek The Next Generation, they formalized the system, with the first number designating the century, the second number based on the season of the show, and the rest still being mostly random. But there's something else interesting you might not have realized. Remember that Buzz tells us that it's Stardate 3901. Do you recall Buzz's first lines in the original Toy Story? When he first comes to life in Andy's room, he also starts mission log and tells us that this is Stardate 4072. Buzz Light, your mission log, Stardate 4072. My ship is run off course en route to Sector 12. Is this similar to the Star Trek numbering system in that the first two digits might represent the year? Which means that Buzz we see in the first Toy Story movie thinks that roughly a year has passed since this moment in Lightyear. Could it represent even more time? We'll have to wait for the movie to find out, but you won't have to wait for more secrets in this trailer. Next, we see Buzz, now without his trademark bubble helmet, approaching a spaceport where he'll learn he'll be part of a hyperspeed test flight. We get a good look at the Pip-Boy from Fallout-like communicator on Buzz's arm, which in addition to recording his mission logs, also appears to be able to do atmospheric scanning to determine whether the air is breathable and has buttons labeled Control, Feed, and VCTR, which probably stands for Vector and would aid Buzz in navigation. His mission log is interrupted by Commander Hawthorne, though, who we've learned from the leaked concept art that her first name is Alicia. And there's something else you've definitely missed here, when we get a good look at the insignia on Buzz and Alicia's arms. Take a closer look at it and see if it reminds you of anything. Looks like the ship from the beginning of the trailer, right? The ship is taking off in the logo, and it also bears a strong resemblance to the Atari logo. The Atari was a game console from the 1980s, and one of the most infamous games is the one based on, you guessed it, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. The game is regarded as one of the worst ever made and has been blamed as one of the reasons for the video game crash of the early 80s, which almost destroyed the entire industry. Is Buzz's patch on his arm yet another reference to E.T.? I'm gonna say yes. Are you ready for more secrets and easter eggs? Because there's lots more to come. Commander Hawthorne asks Buzz if he's ready, and we see Buzz in an outfit that's more reminiscent of another sci-fi movie pilot's outfit than his usual Space Ranger suit. Do you know which one? It might not be orange here, but Buzz's suit looks a lot like the one Rebel pilots wear in Star Wars. 
Buzz's ship, which we learned from the first trailer is called the XL-01, is prepared for takeoff, as opposed to Star Cruiser 42, which was a ship in the animated series. It's clear now that Buzz is the test pilot for a new method of travel. Commander Hawthorne and Buzz then both get to say half of Buzz's most famous catchphrase, to infinity and beyond. Did you catch that? They touch the tips of their index fingers together. Yet another ET reference. At this point, it's definitely more than just a coincidence, but just wait until you see what happens next. The XL-01 takes off into space, and as Sox the robot cat presses a button, if you pause, pause, get it? Anyway, you can see that there's an indicator light for crystallic lock, confirming that this is a test of the use of crystallic fusion. In the animated series, crystallic fusion was a form of power that came with crystals mined on the underwater world of Bathios, and confirms that these are what the crystals shown in the first trailer were. If you're quick, you can see Buzz press a button for hyperlaunch and the ship immediately takes off, with the star stretching out like in Star Wars when a ship enters hyperspace. Huh, hyperlaunch, hyperspace, yet another sci-fi movie connection? And get ready because there's more. Buzz screams as the XL-01 travels through space before exiting out of a portal or a jump gate of some kind. We also get a good look at the controls of the XL-01, which look similar to the buttons on Buzz's arm communicator. It appears that Star Command is nothing if not consistent in their designs. We also see that there's pieces of confetti strewn around the cockpit, and some even on socks. Perhaps this was meant to be part of a celebration for the first ship to hyperjump? But there's no time to celebrate, since you likely missed yet another Easter egg. Buzz's ship lands on what looks to be a desolate planet, and he fires a flare into the sky as he tries to reach Star Command on his communicator, saying, Buzz Lightyear to Star Command, come in Star Command, before asking, why don't they answer? Once again saying the exact same thing he did in the first Toy Story when he first comes alive on Andy's bed. Star Command, come in. Do you read me? Why don't they answer? Then we see a shot of Buzz in his orange flight suit, carrying what looks to be one of the crystals used to power space flight. And here we have yet another sci-fi reference. If Flight Suit and the jump to hyperspace don't clue you in, Lightyear looks to be showing its love for more sci-fi movies than just E.T. And here, Buzz's situation looks very similar to when Luke Skywalker lands his X-Wing on Dagobah in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. Buzz's Flight Suit now looks almost exactly like a rebel pilot's, and even has a cute robot companion with him, just like Luke had in R2-D2. Buzz is just lucky his ship isn't sinking into the swamp the way Luke's did since it's doubtful he'll be learning to control the Force on this mission. There's plenty more obscure references you missed the first time, though. Buzz is tackled by a mysterious figure, who we soon learn is Hawthorne, but not the Hawthorne you think it is. This isn't Commander Alicia Hawthorne, but her granddaughter Izzy. And check out the number on her armor. Does it seem special to you? Anytime the number 42 pops up in a work in sci-fi, it's almost guaranteed to be a reference to Douglas Adams' novel series The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where it's revealed that the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything, is 42. But back to this being Commander Hawthorne's granddaughter. Clearly, something isn't right. Sox calculates how much time has passed, and we learn they've been gone 62 years, 7 months, and 5 days. What? I can't believe it, and neither can Buzz. The trailer really kicks off now, and we see Izzy and Buzz running up to a fortress with the word Zap on it several times. We know from toys being released for the film that Izzy is a member of a group called Zap Patrol, who fights back against the threat of Zerg on the planet Takani Prime. That's right, thanks to a toy, you're now one of the very first to know the name of the planet Lightyear takes place on. Izzy enlists Buzz to assist Zap Patrol in their mission to destroy an alien ship, and introduces us to the rest of the team, which includes Darby, an explosives expert, who joined the team to shave some time off her sentence. And if you're quick, you can also see from her suit that Darby's last name is Steel. Next up is Mo Morrison, who is about to find out that he signed up for a lot more than just a fun boot camp thing. Buzz looks to be in some trouble as he's carried away by a Zyclops, one of the yellow robot soldiers who make up the army that serves Zerg. These appear to be quite similar to the Zerg bots from Toy Story 2, who had the exact same yellow and black color scheme. Next, we see Buzz wielding a cool electric melee weapon to slice through an alien tentacle full of green goo, and then against a swarm of flying armored bugs where he also has a new laser pistol. And there's another amazing sci-fi easter egg coming up. We hear Sox explain that the probability of survival for this mission they're on is 38.2%. Do you remember another non-human creature delivering a similar line? That's right, Star Wars again, this time also from The Empire Strikes Back, when C-3PO tells Han Solo that the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3720 to 1, or 0.027%. So Buzz and the gang at least have better odds than the crew of the Millennium Falcon did. 
Next, we get some great shots of Zerg in his new form, which has changed quite a bit since we first saw him in Toy Story 2. Izzy tells Buzz that her grandma, Commander Hawthorne, always believed in him, and we see that she's even been memorialized with a statue that appears to show her older than when we saw her at the beginning of the trailer, so it looks like she at the very least got to live a long life. Zerg then reveals he's gotten some weapon upgrades, including a grappling hook arm. But did you catch that shot that's almost the exact recreation of one from a previous movie? Other than being reversed, the pose Zerg takes with his triple-barreled blaster is almost exactly the same shot from Toy Story 2. A robotic voice then asks for the crew to record their last words, and we can see that these are coming from the ship's computer, which is named Ivan. Ivan is likely an acronym, since Pixar likes to give their robots and AI humans names like WALL-E, which stands for Waste Allocation Load Lifter Earth Class. What do you think Ivan stands for, though? Buzz's last words recorded by Ivan are, Do not vomit inside the vehicle. And Ivan then asks if you're satisfied with recording, please select 1. It looks like the technology for automated voice controls hasn't improved with the advent of interplanetary travel. Buzz tries to get Izzy to do the same E.T.-style finger-touch thing he used to do with her grandmother, but Izzy isn't having it, thinking that he wants instead to pull his finger. If you look in the background, you can see another character too. While Darby and Moe are both wearing their full armor, which makes them look like robots, next to them is an actual robot. This is the same robot we saw in the first trailer, and we know it's a robot because of the name, Eric. Eric, just like Ivan, probably stands for something, but it might also be a reference to another robot named Eric which was the first ever British robot that was built all the way back in 1928. After that, the second trailer for Lightyear is over. I hope you liked this video and found some cool new details you haven't seen before in Disney Pixar's Lightyear. Make sure you subscribe to Movie Logic for more daily movie facts, trivia, and Easter eggs.